Thank you. I love those two qualities. Uh, a couple pre-notes, though, before I begin, and I'm, I have to admit I'm going to be pretty wedded to my text up here because there's a, a lot of moving parts to it. Um, first pre-note, you see an icon up here. This is the most recent icon done by Sister Ann Davidson, who's sitting in the back. Thank you, Sister Ann. Sister Ann, I think it was about maybe a year and a half ago, I approached you and I said, could you do an icon of Jesus and John? It's not an image from scripture that we see uh, much of, but I had always been taken with that scriptural passage. So she, she got to thinking about it, and I got to forgetting about it. And I came back for a retreat uh, later, and I, Sister Ann saw me, and she immediately remembered that I had asked her to do this, and I said, ooh, this is gonna become real. Um, and so I said, yes, I'm still interested in doing it, I'm interested, and um, thank you, Sister Ann, for your persistence. Um, it, 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 there was a lot of work and time and energy put into this, and I appreciate all of it, so thank you for that. So I wanna share it with you now, as a way to grace it and bless it here in this assembly. So thank you for that. Uh, second uh, in intro note, and then I'm going to get right on to this talk. Janet Erskine Stewart has this quote that I read in her a little book put in, uh, on prayer, on her prayers. And it's this. Professional anxiety is necessary to give work its living element. <laughs> well, I have a lot of professional anxiety right now. So I certainly hope that there's a living element uh, that's going to express itself here. So here we go. What an invitation to reflect on the plan of studies of the Society of the Sacred Heart vis-a-vis -vis my brief 13 years working in a Sacred Heart school and 10 years as an associate. You know who I am, I'm Murray O'Connor, and I'm both excited and I'm nervous to be here. I attended two previous spirituality forums, but never in this capacity. So I'm grateful, I think, to Sister Jenny, uh, Jenny Dennehy for inviting me to speak. Sister Jenny, are you here? There you are. Thank you. Right. Honestly, I feel the need to state the obvious. I'm gender challenged. I teach in an all-male school, Sacred Heart School. And I'm nowhere near as accomplished as Sister Kathleen Hughes, Suzanne Cook, and Ilya Delio. The question crossed my mind a few times. What am I doing here? Besides, it's amazing to realize that our addresses at this spirituality forum may reach hundreds of people who live and love the educational mission of the society. Now, that word, society. It conjures personal memories of my nearly 10 years with the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. But since coming to know the Society of the Sacred Heart, I have found a familiar spiritual home. There are 2,500 RSCJ sisters in 41 countries who tirelessly work and pray to deepen the understanding of God's love and reveal it to the world through the service of education. Now, there's a truly amazing effort, and one for which I am, I'm sure for which we all are, truly grateful. I included a quote at the top of my address from Tim Creter. He's an author and cartoonist who wrote, We Know Nothing. He also wrote a recent opinion piece in the New York Times entitled, I know what you think of me. In it, he states, if we want the rewards of being loved, we have to submit to the mortifying ordeal of being known. I find those words alluring because it seems that the history of the plan of studies is just that, a mortifying ordeal of being known. So that God's love could be more deeply known and revealed. My goal in this address is to reflect on three areas. Our contemporary religious landscape with its particular challenges to faith and religion. 
The plan of studies as mostly formulated in 1899 and 1958, and glimpses of how we live out our plan of studies today through the goals and the criteria. I speak before you in three capacities. One, as a practicing Catholic. Two, as someone who dabbles in theology. And three, and as you know this, as an associate. My apologies if I mispronounce a name, cite an incorrect date, and or seem preachy at times. I tend to do one or the other, or all three, but never simultaneously. <laughs> First, let us examine what we, as religious and educators of the Sacred Heart, encounter among youth and religion, at least here in the United States, and how that might impact our educational ministry. Not long ago, Molly Worthen, an assistant professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, pointed out in her article, One Nation Under God? Question mark, a real challenge to what both the plan of studies and maybe even Janet Erskine Stewart only remotely considered. The current waning appeal of organized religion and institutional church governance. It seems in reading the plan of studies and the writings of Janet Stewart, there's a clear assumption that religion and church enjoy strong societal foundations. Many of us here would most likely agree that religion and church played strong influential roles in our lives simply because they were so deeply woven into the familial and social fabric of our day. That's not so clear among today's youth and the younger generations. They increasingly self-identify as spiritually independent, and they are far more vocal about it. I offer no judgments on this, but simply recognize what appears to be the case. Worthen states, we know then that the good old days were not so good after all. Today's spiritual independence are not unprecedented. What is new is their increasing visibility. She continues by quoting Stanley Hauerwas, a, per, a Protestant theologian at Duke Divinity School, on his thoughts concerning the October 2012 Pew poll. Nuns on the rise. As an aside, that's nuns, not nuns. Are you following me there? Okay, good. Um, Hauerwas states, I like the fact that we're getting more nuns because it helps Christians realize that they're different. That's a crucial development. Americans produce people that say, I believe Jesus is Lord. But that's just my personal opinion. And Worthen concludes, the temple of my personal opinion may be the real established church in modern America. Americans are drifting out of the grip of institutional religion just as they are drifting from institutional authority in general. Such a statement should, at the very least, give us serious pause when considering what that may mean for a Sacred Heart education in the 21st century. Just what did the 2012 Pew Poll indicate? For one, people like me and you are being generationally replaced. That's nothing new, really. It's a fact of life that youth eventually replace the old. What's What's of interest is that today's youth are increasingly religiously unaffiliated. A third of adults under 30 have no religious affiliation, 32%, compared with just one in 10 who are 65 and older. And young adults today are much more likely to be, una to be unaffiliated than previous generations were at a similar stage in their lives. When we consider Table 1, Religious Affiliation by Age, it's tempting to see the 67% who are affiliated in the 18 to 19 20, uh, age group, but that percentage is tending downward. Similarly, in Table 2, 
re recent trends in affiliation, we notice that from the boomers to the millennials, that's from 1946 to 1994, there is a rise in religiously unaffiliated. The higher percentage being among the millennials and most likely increasing among today's generation known as the new silent generation or Generation Z. These are the students now populating our schools. With the inescapable reality that an increasing percentage of our students and faculty have no religious affiliation, we may no longer presume shared fundamental religious knowledge, teaching, values, history, etc. Rather, we readily encounter strong personal opinions that tend, at times, to be more defensive than welcoming. I had students at the ripe age of 17 who found it hard to consider any religious point of view at all. And they would say, oh, and why should they? For such students, it's personal, not communal. It's individual, not relational. This addresses what Simone Critchley and Hymason Webster reveal in their current research on the self-help industry and New Age spirituality. It's described as the gospel of authenticity, or more plainly, as narcissism. <laughs> the stroke of genius in the ideology of authenticity is that it doesn't really require a belief in anything and certainly not a belief in anything that might transcend the serene and contented living of one's authentic life and baseline well-being. In this, one can claim to be beyond dogma. There's no grounding here in what Janet Stewart and the plan of studies would call first principles. I'm sure this situation doesn't describe every Sacred Heart student today but it serves as a general assessment of our contemporary situation. Today's Sacred Heart students do not easily align with the description of a Sacred Heart student in the 1899 rule of school. A loyal and contented spirit, courtesy and good breeding, faith, piety, docility, and love of work have always been characteristic of children of the Sacred Heart. We could rewrite this to read, a loyal but independent spirit, polite but inquiring, critically aware, wisely free, and ready to serve. Both ascribe positive attributes to our students, but they fit different worlds. Somewhat related to this issue is the 2008 KQED Forum's interview. KQED is our local public radio station. It was an interview given with the former GTU, Graduate Theological Union President, James Donahue, that explored why so many people are moving away from the faith they grew up with or they know. The Pew poll at the time indicated that 44% of Americans move away from their childhood faith Donahue pointed out that people look for what makes sense to them, and they tend to move away from high doctrine, formalism, and structures that don't speak to them. It seems that people are more inclusive today, more sensitive to diversity. Even if religion is meant to call us to higher standards and meaning, the tension remains between what people want and what faith means. It's true that faith is not cheap or easy, but if faith through religion demands too much, people drift away. That doesn't mean people are not hungry for meaning. They continue to search for it, including our students, present and past. This following video clip of Corey Lenahan, who graduated in 2008 from Stewart Hall, captures what this means for his generation. So when I'm asked to respond 
fiction that is explicitly framed as religious or spiritual or to uh, articulate something through an explicitly spiritual or religious lens, I walk up. Um, and I don't think it's just me, I think it's a lot of people in my generation. I think one key thing about this is that it's not an aversion to asking religious questions or to asking spiritual questions, but instead to that specific language. Um, I think both of those words have connotations that are both positive and negative, but they're so charged that um, there can be this, this uh, act of hedging that wants to happen uh, when we hear them. So with a word like religious, you get like connotations as institutional, of closed. Um, with spiritual, you can get something that's almost cheaper, afraid of committing. I'm often able to answer questions about uh, my spirituality and my religiosity uh, more easily when those two words are actually left out of the picture and we enter the conversation using a different vocabulary. I tend to agree with Corey in that there's no deep-seated resistance to things spiritual and religious among the young but their attention and acceptance depends heavily on the language we use to frame spiritual and religious questions. Catholicism, however, tends to be anti-marketplace. That is, shunning the idea that one option among many equal options is good enough. As a religion, Catholicism makes demands and people adapt. Herein lies the challenge that many Sacred Heart schools face today. Just what does it mean to adapt, to be Catholic in today's world? We have work to do in this area, given what Corey shares, and what our past two Chicago Visiting Committee reports recommended for our schools in San Francisco. That is, that we understand how we are Catholic in our contemporary situation. I am grateful for Sister Maureen Glavin's comment to me that every time our schools write an action plan for the Chicago pro uh, reflection process, we are engaging our vision of the plan of studies. If done with care and confidence, it will build and nurture relationships of accept acceptance and understanding. It will help us more fully embrace what Janet Stewart wrote about a Catholic atmosphere. It is an atmosphere of assurance and confidence and joy and reliance upon a power and love that are unseen but not unfelt. It gives a mutual understanding and affection between Catholic teachers and children. Today's world, however, is not 1820, 1899. 1952, 1958, to mention just some of the revision dates of the plan of studies. Rather, we live in a globally interconnected world hardly envisioned by previous ages. In our classroom, textbooks give way to iPads and all manners of electronic and technical logical information. In a recent iPad workshop for teachers that I attended, the following quote by Alan Kay came up. Technology is only technology to those who were born before it. <laughs> That's to say that I, the teacher, am dealing with technology while they, the students, are simply living life. Which brings up another issue worth consideration. Our students are well connected to the internet with high speed access and super bandwidth. That's not the case for many other students in impoverished areas where an internet connection is so slow it, ren it renders it useless. That cannot, they cannot know the global context through the immediacy of technology like our students, which has interesting implications that are beyond my talk. To say we as educators or administrators understand the power of modern technology is incredible. That is unbelievable. Because the pace of technological advances in society in general and education in particular are simply staggering. 
The minds, hearts, and imagination of teenagers and young adults are our prized possessions. For only a short time, and what we teach and offer them determines a great deal. In our quick-paced world, where the pause button needs to be intentionally pressed but rarely is, our care of the student must very much mimic the plan of studies, but in a considerably different way. If we want our students to slow down, be attentive, be reflective, and be conscious about their choices in the culture in which they are immersed, then we must interfere every once in a while and do what's culturally counterindicated. And this is where we may find ourselves implementing the spirit of the plan of studies more than we may know. I return to our opening quote. Certainly, if we want to be loved, we must submit to being known, no matter the effort or cost. If we are committed to discovering and revealing God's love, then we have to know who we are, a constant and challenging effort. The plan of studies provides a window to our educational past that can, as a mirror does, reflect who we are today and how we are known. Each formulation of the plan comes from a different age and time, offering directives, rules, and insights appropriate to Sacred Heart schools in their particular time and place. Yet all seem to honor the ideal end of education in the society held by Madeline Sophie Barra. To bring about in the world by means of these, these children a flowering, of the reign of the heart of Jesus, May they profit by their education and become one day examples and even apostles in the midst of the world. The third general congregation in 1820 drew up the first uniform plan of studies. However, it was St. Madeline Sophie Barra who in 1804 composed the first plan at Amiens under the advice of Father Jean-Michel Agoriquet. His experience of teaching boys in Amiens suited him to the task. It offered a singular curricular approach for all the boarding schools, but with time, that singular approach gave way to adaptations that would serve new countries, cultures, and accommodate changing conditions. It was Marie von Loy, elected Superior General in 1915, whose reformulation of the plan of studies described education as a work of progressive development. Gradually, the plan moved away from detailed curricular instruction and focused more on guiding teachers. By 1952, the plan set forth to educate the whole woman with a view to her own vocation in the circumstance and the age in which she has to live. Thus, adaptability became a major thrust that would ensure future educational relevancy. However, Superior General Marie Therese de Lespieux, 1844 to 1957, oversaw a complete rewriting of the plan of studies focusing on the spirit of Sacred Heart education that would traverse the varying external circumstances in which Sacred Heart schools existed. The point had been reached where uniformity in subject matter was neither possible or desirable. This new document had a slightly modified title, Spirit and Plan of Studies. In this new spirit, Sacred Heart schools adapted courses, programs, and methods to best suit the particular need of an individual school. The introduction states, this present work deliberately puts aside all details of syllabus, for these are bound to vary according to time and space. Its main object is to give a clear idea of a spirit, a spirit which will hold good for for every work of education and teaching in boarding schools, free schools, training colleges, and university colleges. One critical issue arising from this new approach was losing a shared connection or relationship among the many Sacred Heart schools. 
However, the writing of the goals and criteria in 1975, revised in 1990 and 2005, helped to provide the feeling of belonging to a larger whole, of sharing principles and values, broad purposes, hopes, and ambitions. In 1899, the increase in the number of Sacred Heart schools spurred another revision of the plan of studies. This plan, however, sought perfect uniformity of teaching in all houses of higher, in all houses, a higher standard of culture attained by the mistresses and a barrier opposed to the vain pretentiousness of a proud age which Christian wisdom and simplicity condemn. If this sounds a bit like circling the wagons, it was. The move from the 19th to the 20th century was a tumultuous period in church history that only a short time earlier saw its temporal foundations weakened in the Risorgimento or reunification of Italy and its teaching authority challenged with the rise of Darwinism and Marxism. We all know about the syllabus of errors, Pope St. Pius X's 1907 encyclical condemning modernism, and his 1910 oath against modernity that mandated, quote, all clergy, pastors, confessors, preachers, religious superiors, and professors in theological seminaries swear to it, I'm fairly certain that Janet Stewart took the oath. The oath remained in effect until 1967. So the signs of the time clearly impacted the writing of this plans of study. It stands apart from that freedom found in the 1958 plan that considered an open and prudent outlook necessary for every mistress, as well as for the apostolic orientation that characterized education in the society. Looking closer at this 1899 plan, the language clearly has faith guiding educational endeavors. It opens with sacred history, dogma, and morals being the chief part of instruction, stating that nothing will therefore be left undone to enlighten their minds with the light of faith while striving at the same time to infuse piety into their hearts. So it's no surprise when it proceeds to guide the mistresses who teach the profane sciences to do so in view of God. And remember that the only science whose objective is eternal should receive a much more ardent, persevering, and generous zeal. This thinking although somewhat biased by today's standards, is not far from what Madeline Sophie Barra wrote in her December 1851 circular letter. A truly religious mistress of class knows how to profit with skill and zeal all the sciences which she teaches puts into her hands in order to attain the principal end to form the mind and heart of her young pupils. Furthermore, this carries over to the 1858 plan in the description of a good teacher. A good teacher, whatever her age, must always remain young. That is attuned to the mentality of her pupils, on her guard against routine and always ready to learn. A true educator seeks above all the fundamental training of her children's soul. And this, both naturally and supernaturally, is paid for by thorough and conscientious work. This integration of religious instruction and formation was normative. Naturally, students enrolled at Sacred Heart schools for a good general education. But the plan of studies ensured their growth in faith and character. In 1899, the students were divided into 10 classes, the 10th class for the youngest, the first class for those about to graduate. But there was a two-year superior class. This class seemed to offer pre-collegiate studies where the teaching had to be, quote, delightful. 
so that it was everyone's ambition to follow it. I wondered if this were an enticement to keep the students in school a couple more years. Most likely it was, because the first class addressed those who were about to complete their education and graduate. Nonetheless, this superior class had an undefined course of studies, which presented a contrast to the earlier classes. It states, the plan cannot be exactly drawn up. The mistress of studies must modify it according to circumstance. Perhaps a hint of wise freedom can be read in this. Nevertheless, the very first suggested course of studies for this superior class was Christian philosophy. Considering the third class, perhaps the equivalence of our ninth or tenth graders the mistress, guided by the Holy Spirit, must endeavor to control her children with wise authority and gentle firmness, directing their energy to study, thus occupying their minds, while she tends to engrave thoughts of faith daily more deeply in the hearts which are so dear to the heart of Jesus. Yet the plan is full of many other directives not relating to faith or religion, for the sixth class corresponding to some point in later elementary school, the plan insisted on correct spelling and, consider it, and considered it the most important area of study, but only after sacred history and reading. And in the earliest period of education, the ninth class, all teaching was done orally and by demonstration. There was some spelling, reading, and attempts at writing, but the plan states that even before they can read, they must say their morning and evening prayers with correct pronunciation and due pauses. <laughs> it fell to the mistress to explain each word and to inspire respect and gratitude for God's goodness. But it's clearly stated that Copying out prayers and verses of the gospel shall never be imposed as a penance. This must have been done in, in some places, but not in Sacred Heart schools. <laughs> An additional wise practice focused on the mistress's correction of copybooks as one of her most important duties in coming to instruct and know her students. But the plan warns, the preparation of class must not be sacrificed to it, for more good is done by teaching children to do better than by pointing out what is wrong. Now, there's timeless wisdom. There is an intriguing element in this 1899 plan of studies, one not, not touching directly upon faith, it was the effort to integrate domestic economy and housekeeping into the lives of the students. Many of the young women who attended Sacred Heart schools likely went on to be heads of households, where such practical training would serve them well. Pride of place, however, went to needlework, and we need look no further than our Mater Admirabilis fresco to understand this. Mary, with distaff, spindle, basket, and book, suggests the work most suitable for young women. Needlework could be a means of livelihood or economy, but certainly it was, quote, useful as a preservative against idleness and its fatal consequences of ennui, indolence, frivolous conversations, and dangerous reading. Moreover, it's helpful in enabling them to relieve the poor and work for the altar. At a recent lunch, when I mentioned this passage to Jim Pekowitz, whose foundation helps me organize service emergent trips to Mexico, he immediately pulled out from his backpack knitting needles and yarn. He was knitting a scarf. Later that same day, when meeting with Anne-Marie Krejcarek, our new president, she offered to sew Jim a few knitting moves. 
I discovered something very significant that day, which helped me appreciate why this plan of studies emphasized the practice of needlework. This plan, however, was not so accommodating when it came to music. Any musicians out there? All right, brace yourselves. One reads some harsh words. Parents from all classes of society are, quote, blind enough to sacrifice to this art time and money that they would grudge to give anything else, so that the greater part of the short and precious time of education is still further curtailed so as to give more time to music. Apparently, too much music led to an overexcited imagination, a weakened will, and vanity. Parents needed to understand how injurious endless music practice was to a student's nerves and mental energies. <laughs> Nevertheless, students studied music and undoubtedly practiced long hours against the expressed wishes of the plan of studies, because the plan relents, stating, since we cannot cure the error of our time, we are often reluctantly obliged to yield to the wishes of parents who only send their children to us for the sake of having them taught the piano or singing. But under the influence of the Sacred Heart, quote, these children may learn the worthlessness of a talent acquired at so great a cost. Why such harsh view of what it calls an accomplishment or what we today would call an extracurricular activity? I'm not sure. But isn't it true that even today, some decry the dilution of education when too much time is dedicated to sports, publications, student government, or other activities? The world into which these young women of 1899 ventured seemed unfriendly, if not hostile. Janet Stewart, fully alive at the time, saw the importance of well-formed faith in unfriendly times. For faith to hold on its course against all that tends to carry it away, it's needful that it should not be found unprepared. The minds of the young cannot expect to be carried along by Catholic public opinion. Now, as in the earliest stages of the church, the faithful stand in small assemblies or as individuals amid cold and hostile surroundings. An individual faith and sanctity are the chief means of extending the kingdom of God on earth. Therefore, the work of the mistress was, quote, to confirm their faith and practice of virtue while trying to complete their general knowledge. In the end, Solidity was far more essential than variety. Perhaps this particular passage indicates the attitude adopted towards life beyond a Sacred Heart school. These chosen children of the Sacred Heart, recipient of so many graces, are about to enter a life fraught with danger. With what zeal with what, with what zeal will not a truly religious mistress seize every opportunity of forming their mind, their judgment, and their heart, teaching them to guard their affections, and warning them against the false maxims and pernicious influences of the world which will soon assail, even if it does not tarnish, their innocence. I do not believe there ever was an age where faith found easy acceptance, individually, socially, or culturally. Faith needs formation, time, and work, if it will be of any benefit. It seems this was well understood by those responsible for safeguarding a Sacred Heart education. Clearly, the individual student matters for the plan of studies, for it states, should there be more than 25 pupils in a class, it is not only desirable, but even necessary to divide it. For a mistress cannot conscientiously follow the work of a large number. This parallels well what Mary Quinlan wrote about Janet Stewart, that each individual is unique 
and has certain potentialities which, if they are fostered, will bring about the maturing of the whole person. She advocated that the teacher in the classroom study each pupil as an individual and refrain from making what we might call carbon copies of an original which perhaps was only in the mind of the teacher. It is nearly impossible to avoid carbon copies given large class sizes. Most of my years teaching involved five classes a year with 30 to 40 students per class. I bet some teachers would even envy that. And this core and this focus on the individual is not lost in the 1958 plan where it states, each child being unique in the divine thought must be the object of attentive interest and material care on the part of educators. It is the personal progress of each that must be sought. A certain individualization of work is therefore to be combined with collective teaching. This closely aligns with today's differentiated instruction, where teachers create a, vi a variety of ways to acquire content given differences in ability and background. As to class size, this plan also states, no group should be too numerous. Classes, therefore, will be subdivided whenever this may seem to help. Similar to the 1899 plan and to all the other formulations of the plan, the 1958 plan stresses the centrality of religious instruction. For Janet Stewart, religious instruction held a twofold importance, first to God and then to the child. God, who entrusts to us their religious education, has a right to be set before them as truly, as nobly, as worthily as our capacity allows, as beautifully as human language can convey the mysteries of faith. The child has a right to learn the best that it can know of God, since the happiness of its life, not only in eternity, but even in time, is bound up to that knowledge. Most grievous wrong has been done and is still done to children by well-meaning but misguided efforts to make them good by dwelling on the vengeance taken by God upon the wicked. If the first impressions of God conveyed to them are gloomy and terrible, a shadow may be cast over the mind so far-reaching that perhaps a whole lifetime may not carry them beyond it. How important it is that today we continue to thoughtfully speak of God in how we instruct our students. Janet Stewart's concern is a shared concern. The 1958 plan refers to Madeline Sophie on the teaching of church doctrine. If the aim of the society in teaching different subjects is to give education by instruction, it is especially in the doctrine classes that our Holy Mother invites us to pursue this end. Over and above mere intellectual knowledge of religion, it is training of soul that she wishes us to ensure. This training of soul should guide our efforts today as we discover new ways to engage a Sacred Heart education through our shared goals and criteria. And what better way to show our plan of studies than to share several examples of it in action. What follows are videos and images that I hope you will find meaningful, relevant, and even enjoyable. They touch upon the incarnational, relational, and transformative power of a Sacred Heart education as taught in our schools today. Since 2004, every senior at Stewart Hall High School in San Francisco writes a paper and creates a video presentation on a Sacred Heart goal and how that goal influenced them during their high school years. They reflect on their personal experience and their learning in relation to their goal. 
I will share the video by Jono Otero Caldwell, who recently graduated and is headed to New York University to study math. He's far more attracted to science than religion. But what he shares of goal one reveals a young man who, even though questioning parts of the goal, takes it seriously. He is that religiously unaffiliated person who speaks his truth. He is that child who falls under Janet Stewart's vision where each child is allowed to be itself and where we, quote, surround it with an atmosphere of so much attentive affection that it may be unconstrained and let out the real self with its good as well as its weak points, thus becoming known, so that it may be taken in hand to correct its defects and taught to know and control itself. The first goal of the schools of the Sacred Heart is old and outdated. In this modern world, it is irrelevant in education to have a belief in God. Even looking at the criteria themselves, there is nothing in an education of truth that should be rooted in the love of Jesus Christ. God can be taught without, the morals can be taught without God, and should not revolve around a Christian God for everybody. If this is what the schools of the Sacred Heart wants its students to aspire to, then I have failed my school. Rabbi Shelley Waldenberg is a Jewish rabbi with ties to Stuart Hall High School. He makes frequent visits to our school to talk to the students. On one of the visits, he talked to the senior class saying, Faith is uncertainty. The courage to ask questions that come from your heart and soul. You argue with God. This is true for faith, and this is why faith is so similar to science. However, what has happened is people are becoming so sure of their faith as an absolute fact that they lose sense of what their faith's initial purpose was. People grow up knowing faith and neglect the one thing that faith really asks them to do. They stop questioning. Faith has pulled away even more from what Pope John XXIII wrote in Pachman Terrace in 1963. Man has a natural right to be respected. He has a right to his good name. He has a right to freedom in investigating the truth. Despite my disbelief in faith, there are still parts of Goal 1 that I do agree with. Goal 1 states, the school fosters inner religious acceptance and dialogue by educating to an understanding of and deep respect for the religions of the world. The schools of the Sacred Heart work to educate their students about all faiths and beliefs. I tried to be accepting of cultures and people around me, and I believe that this is part of the reason that I was awarded the Sherifinsky Award in my junior year. This award went to the student who most embodied the goals of the Sacred Heart. I thought I had no chance at this award because of my active voice against God and religion. However, goal one is also about acceptance, and I work to accept people different from myself. You can imagine the be that beginning his reflection calling gold one old and outdated, and that it's irrelevant to have a belief in God would raise a few eyebrows. However, is he a failure as he suggests? His questioning reveals an openness to a search for meaning grounded in the acceptance of others. He hasn't closed out God or shut down faith but remains open to their possibility through his intellectual curiosity. I believe Jono's current position closely aligns with what Janet Stewart said in her conferences on education in 1898. Quote, we must give our children fair play, rope enough to hang themselves by, <laughs> as the saying is. They come to us very raw material, quite unformed. Un, yeah, unformed. And we must put into them the active principle. Make them take their faculties in hand and learn how to use them, how to observe. It also closely aligns with what Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio, now Pope Francis I, valued as a culture of encounter, grounded in a dialogue that is born from a respectful attitude toward the other person, from a conviction that the other person has something good to say. Our goals and criteria are a life force for Sacred Heart education. 
They provide a grounding similar to the plan of studies. Commenting on the goals and criteria, Sister Susan Maxwell, Sister, you're here. In the spring 2013 issue of Heart Magazine said, I grow more and more convinced that the life we are experiencing in our network schools is not simply the result of the wonderful programs and projects to develop the lives of our students and entire school communities, but the union of those outward signs with the profound inner lives that living the goals and the criteria produces. Our goals and criteria permit the touching of the inner life or that training of soul of which Sophie Barra speaks. They allow us to create opportunities that challenge and inspire students to truly assess who they are and how they live from the youngest to the oldest. Convent of the Sacred Heart School in San Francisco, our sister school, recently had their seniors reflect on the goals and criteria under the guidance of Kate McMichael. Here, Gina Demare produced a video on goal three, where she went out onto the streets of San Francisco and got to know several homeless people. Through this project, she did what the 1958 plan considered indispensable, the training of soul. Here are some excerpts from Gina's video. My name is Gina DeMerg, and I am on a journey. I'm on a journey to help the homeless and hopefully find myself in the process. I started my journey about a year ago, but like most journeys, they begin long before we're able to realize they're happening. I have interviewed many homeless people in San Francisco to show others that those we overlook have so much to offer. I wanted to do this because I wanted to help change some lives and make lives better. That was my goal when I started. And I was changed more than I think I changed anyone else's life. JR is one of the, um, someone that I've met from the beginning and since I started my journey. I decided you know, to talk to him more. JR told me the most important thing in life is to be nice and grateful. When you do those two things, good things will come your way. And I asked him how he, he learned the message. I've been around a long time. I've learned a lot of how to read people and watch them. And his message has really stayed with me ever since he told me. So remember that you don't know who in your life you can make an impact on. You don't know how much your actions really affect other people. One thing that I wish people would take from this video is that anybody can change a life and anyone can make a difference. So go around and make that difference. Because in the process, you just might find yourself like I have. Gina embraced goal three in a very real and transformative way. She formed relationships with the most visibly invisible people in our society. And what happened? One more person who is socially and critically aware, more empathetic and compassionate, more willing to act for justice on behalf of the poor. Such projects that challenge students to delve deeply into the goals and criteria were most likely not done decades ago. But today, they are part of our modern plan that utilizes real-world learning to teach values and character. I am grateful as well for those from our network schools who set examples of the goals and the criteria in action. From Stone Ridge, Terry Gonzalez, thank you, Terry, she's here. Terry Gonzalez shared artwork and a poem. 
This creative art piece shows an array of crayons representing the young age at which the artist, Carolyn Olson, began her Sacred Heart education. There are five colors, and each color represents one of the goals. Each color works together, not in isolation. Carolyn writes, I have only been successful in living my Sacred Heart life to the fullest when I use all of the goals in my life instead of taking them as separate and solitary rules. The crayons melt and bleed onto the canvas, but not in any controlled way, although at one point she tried to control the flow. Reflecting upon this, Carolyn states, I feel like this represents one of the main themes I have learned this year. It is explained in the quote by St. Madeline Sophie. God does not ask of us the perfection of tomorrow or even tonight, but only in the present moment in which we are acting. When I am only focused on where I am going and what will happen in the future, I miss what is going on in my life at the present moment. This poem, only part of it here, by Madeline Engler, begins with the many fears that haunt her, but quickly pivots on a devotion to St. Teresa of the Little Flower, represented by the roses. She pictures herself as a tree, stating, we are all made in the image of God, and all that God creates is good. Therefore, I chose to cast myself in the image of a tree in order to express the sense of belonging and harmony I receive from being in nature. The tree laid, lays down five roots, representing the five goals about which she writes. Just as a tree needs lots of roots to gain strong footing in the ground, I need all the goals to build a foundation for my future choices. These are two wonderfully creative examples of how a Sacred Heart education instills a sense of hope, purpose, faith and values using the imaginations and talents of individual students. Linda Palin at Forest Ridge in Washington State implemented student-led conferences, inviting students to reflect with their teachers on each goal and criteria. She developed focused questions for each criteria. What a beautiful opportunity for students to take active ownership of their Sacred Heart education through intentional reflection with their teachers. I'm glad to note that this practice is spreading to other Sacred Heart schools. In fact, we just started it at Stuart All High School. Sister Maureen Glavin, exploring Sacred Heart education in a global context, shared how Sacred Heart Academy immerses their students in global education. She states that the deepest need of the human heart, the need for God, for meaning, for justice, for belonging and for equality, are the core of our educational vision. Sister Maureen implemented the global education curriculum at the Academy in St. Charles, and she views it as a great example of integrating something new for the 21st century that our students need in order to be poised as global citizens. Finally, Ann Hoppeno at, at Stewart Country Day School in New Jersey shares that a French class wrote a book of Haitian stories and legends in French and English. The book will be shared with a class from College Marius Carnard in Haiti this summer when the French teacher travels there. The teacher will work with Haitian students who will translate the legends into Creole and create illustrations. The aim is to collaboratively create a book that will be distributed through the members of a nonprofit organization to raise funds to pay for teachers' salaries at the school in Haiti. In concluding, I would say that our way of proceeding accomplishes what the many earlier plans of studies did for their particular times and places. We continue to value individuality, 
adaptability, faith, and structure. But we hinge ourselves to the goals and criteria. We teach them to our students, and we allow our students to freely engage them. We do not have uniform plans and specific directives that would inevitably need to be greatly modified given the demands of a globalized world. Instead, we have a set of strongly and precisely worded goals by which we formally evaluate our school communities every five years through the Chicago reflection process. The goals provide the gateway to transform our world intellectually, technologically, aesthetically, and ethically through strong relationships that reflect the incarnational love of God. This is our plan of studies, and it, like the others, provides what Janet Erskine Stewart said of an American student reflecting on her Sacred Heart education. In terse American phrase, you give values and you give anchorage. Thank you.